Hi, this is Alana. Welcome to the Praying Christian Women podcast. Thanks for joining us. I'm here with my friend and co-host and prayer partner, Jamie Hampton. We are giving you a coffee break episode today. These are based off questions that you guys have sent in to us at prayingchristianwomen.com slash questions. I'm excited to dive into today's show and let's start with the word of prayer. God, thanks for bringing us here today to discuss some listener questions. We just pray that you would guide and direct our conversation and just help us to glorify you in the discussion of this topic. And we just pray that you would um, just help us to really specifically address the issues that these ladies are looking to hear about. And, And we just thank you so much for giving us the time to be here and just the privilege of being part of this podcast. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Yeah, I'm excited to dive into our topic. It's about how to pray when it doesn't even seem like God's listening. And I feel like this is a recurring question or theme to the point that we had to pause just a minute ago and be like, have we covered this question? And no, we haven't, but it's, it's on a lot of people's minds. So we're actually combining a couple copyright questions today, right? Yes, there are two. So there's Julie and Sally both put questions in and Julie specifically said, I always wonder just how effective my prayers are, especially when I'm on that mountaintop and haven't started that slide into the valley. And Sally says, this may sound ridiculous, but most days lately, I feel my prayers are going no higher than the soles of my shoes. Am I the only one that feels that way? If I'm not, then I was wondering if we could figure out why we feel that way. Um, So, you know, I think what she's getting at is we know God hears us. We know that prayers are going out, but why do we feel sometimes like there's no movement? We don't sense that being heard from God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any kind of personal experiences? Have you gone through phases like this? Well, the thing that comes to my mind, and so, you know, some of you know that we had the Prevailing Prayer podcast a couple of years, several years ago before this. So I don't know if we've spoken about it on Praying Christian Women, but you and I had this this time where we both were feeling like there were things in our lives, and I can't even remember what they were at the time, but it was kind of a parallel struggle where- mm-hmm. We've we gone through a lot of parallels. <laughs> we have, and but we were feeling like we were not, we had been praying for guidance about certain things, and and we just felt like God wasn't speaking to us. So, you know, this might be the other end of the spectrum uh, when we don't feel like God is even listening. But I mean, if he's, if we don't feel like he's speaking back, maybe we don't feel like he's listening or, um, but we've had those yeah. times where we, well, you know, I think that's why we had to pause and be like, have we covered this question? Cause I know we've covered what to do when God's silent, That which was, is one yes. side of it, right. but this is almost like, he's not just not talking to me. It's like, he doesn't even hear me. Right. Which, like you go ahead. Well, like you feel like there's, there's a brick wall between you and your prayers and there's this sense of like, these prayers aren't even getting out. Mm -hmm, mm Mm-hmm. I want to start. So I want to give a caveat. My, (laughs) I'm on my first cup of coffee, guys. My brain does not feel organized yet. (laughs) (laughs) But what I, what I feel like starting, I just, I had this interesting observation. So my husband and I got married and pretty immediately moved to a new state where he was the youth pastor at the kind of real small country church that he had grown up in. And it was a rocky, we spent two years there. It was a rocky two years for multiple reasons, including I had a couple of pregnancies and miscarriages and lots of hormonal stuff. Plus we were newlyweds in ministry, like a lot of stuff going on. But once we moved away from there, and I even noticed it once when we went just like one state over to visit some friends, like, I felt like there was an actual heaviness in that location. And I thought I was a little bit crazy, but one or two other people who used to live there and have since moved have also mentioned that. I think that we could entertain the possibility that in the spiritual realm, there might be things that we just don't, we don't know what's going on. And I feel like sometimes those are tied geographically. I know, I think it was in our episode on like the perfect prayer room, which was really just like a goofy, lighthearted episode. Yeah, but that was fun. Talk, yeah, we talked about though that some places do feel easier to connect to God in, right? Yeah. So I don't know. It's 
it's just, it was the first thought that popped into my head. And since I still have like groggy morning brain, I thought I would start with that. <laughs> no, I think that's definitely a good point. And we actually, when it reminds me a little bit also of our Smash Your Prayer Blocks online retreat that we put together a while back. And it kind of addressed just several different things that could hinder your prayers or, you know, mm -hmm. things within you. Yes. And, and, you know, there are practical things, biblical things that can be hindering your prayers. Um, yeah. Let's dive into some of those because I feel yeah. like this is, this is the equivalent of going to the doctor with a stomach ache, right? Like there's never going to be one diagnosis. So they're right. going to ask, like, let's triage this All right. <laughs> and see if we can, or maybe triage is not the right word, but you know what I mean? Um, what's it called? Like the dif differential, they do something when they're trying to diagnose. Do you know what I'm talking about? Right. Like going through like, if this, then mm -hmm. X this out mm -hmm. and go to the next mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. 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 Okay. So let's, let's talk first. I feel like it's a good idea to examine ourselves first. So let's start there. Um, just because you're feeling far from God and just because it feels like he doesn't hear you, that certainly doesn't mean that you're in the wrong, right? But right. I think it's not a bad idea to do a little bit of inventory to see if you might be contributing to the problem. So these would be things like unconfessed sins, harboring bitterness or unforgiveness towards somebody. Those are the first two that pop into my head. Yeah. and. Um... I think there's a lot of, uh, I think there's something about, we had talked at one point about marriage, how when the Bible talks about marriage and relationship in your marriage, and, you know, I think particularly on the husband's end, it's mentioned, but we can extrapolate that on the woman's end too, if you are uh, in marital strife, that, you know, that could be something if you're not treating your spouse with respect or I, I'll have mm -hmm. to find that verse and maybe put it in the notes. But. Well, it talks about, um, if I, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I feel like you're talking about the verse where it's talking about not abstaining from marital relationships unless it's for a specific period of time. And then it says, so that nothing can hinder your prayers. And yeah. so oh, the idea I didn't even know about that one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, I know that that's there. So yeah, there could be any any type of relational strife. But I also want to throw out there that sometimes you might have an unrestored relationship that is not your fault. Like I had a broken relationship for a couple years. And yes, I had work to do on my own heart with bitterness and unforgiveness. But the fact, so I used to think, this is when I was like a very, very young adult. I used to think that because somebody was mad at me, I didn't have the right to take communion. And so this was like a thing in my head. And well, no, just because somebody's upset with you, <laughs> right? I mean, think of how many people hated Paul. He would have never had communion. <laughs> so, but again, like we, these are good places to start yeah. at the very least. Um, well, and my very favorite psalm for that is just Psalm 139, 23, and 24, that just just to pray that psalm directly, search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Test me, know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive mm -hmm. way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And, and when we pray that or we pray the equivalent of that to God, I mean, you just sit down with a journal and, and just mm -hmm. sit and meditate and see if God brings anything to mind. For sure. But I think on the flip side, like you had said before, don't assume that, that there is something like that because, you know, obviously we all have sin in our lives, but don't assume that, oh, my prayers are definitely being hindered because I've sinned or because, mm -hmm. you know, it's a good place to start. But I think sometimes we, for me, I tend to overdo it and try to read and make it all things. about you. <laughs> right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And it, it might, it not, might be not be, you at all. but yeah. ask God to make it clear. And I think he'll really make it clear if there is something that needs to be reconciled or dealt For with. Sure. And I think it's important to be as self-aware as possible because some people like, I'm going to assume based on what you just said, this might, you might fall into this camp. You might go overboard with the guilt. You might go overboard in assuming that it's all your fault. Whereas other people might be like, I'm perfect. You know, everybody else is a way worse sinner than I am. And so I think knowing where you fall on that spectrum 
is useful. If you're always the kind of person who's going to blame yourself for everything, then maybe you need to go easy on yourself. If you're the kind of person who's always making excuses for your behavior, maybe you need to do a little bit more of a deep dive and be like, hey, this, this might be on me. Might not, but it might be. Um, let's also talk about just the physical spiritual connection, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you're a sleep deprived new mom (laughs) or something like that, or you've started a new medication and I know that that can sometimes just mess with, you know, your ability to focus, things like that. These are all things that can impact your spiritual life. And I know I was really resistant to that idea for a long time because I was mm-hmm. like, well, the spirit's stronger than the body, but they're still connected, right? We're not in heaven yet. We've got a body. Yeah. So, no. And I, and you had talked about when you were newly married that there may have been a spiritual component, but you did mention, yeah, I was hormonal, had miscarriages. Sure. These are all traumatic, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. difficult things. And, you know, yeah. this morning I, I was getting my kids out the door and I thought, oh, I haven't taken vitamins since we had gone out of town like two weeks, four yeah. weeks ago. So, you know, vitamins and absolutely sunlight. I mean, in Alaska, we have to, we have to consider that sunlight and the lack of in the winter is, is going to impact. And I've, I've kind of sensed my own rhythms. And I know that ironically, when the sun starts to come back is when I have issues. I don't know why, but it's like a reverse thing when, when I I like the spring time. Yeah. Yeah, that maybe, maybe you just like your body gets so used to darkness (laughs) that when it's not operating in darkness, you just freak out or something. Yeah, my body's like, what? Oh, that's so sad. It is, Um, but I know that and I think, think, okay, it's not necessarily that I'm having a spiritual crisis. I just, I need to take my vitamins and sleep well and and give myself Mm -hmm. some grace and and being aware of that can sometimes help your prayer life because you're like, oh, hey God, I know I'm not my best or even like you this morning, well, I've kind of got brain fog because I haven't had my yeah. second cup of coffee. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Just being gentle with yourself. And um, speaking of brain fog, I had a point that I was going to bring up. <laughs> totally forgot it. But um, just, you know, on, I'm going to just kind of keep rambling until it comes back to me, like on the topic of just that physical, spiritual connection. Yeah. I think that taking time to even slow down can be really nice. I know I get into these phases where like, maybe I found a new podcast. Like I can stay up kind of late just in bed listening because that's, that kind of is my quiet downtime and my husband's up early. And so we go to bed early, but I'm not ready to sleep yet. So like there are weeks where I'll probably listen to podcasts for like two or three hours every night and be up, you know, past midnight. And I'm not saying that that's a terrible thing. Like every single person listening obviously listens to podcasts, <laughs> but I think sometimes what I, what I try to do to, to um, make sure that I'm not going overboard is I always start with like 15 to 30 minutes of just lying quietly because sometimes if your brain's so programmed to be getting constant input, then it does get very hard to slow down to pray. I remember a couple months ago, I, it was the very first time I got addicted to a, and I use the term loosely, like not in the, I don't want to make light of an issue, but just some dumb smartphone Tetris game. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I realized, okay, yes, I was on vacation. I think it was over Thanksgiving or something (laughs) like, so, okay, but still, do I need to be playing that four hours a day? No, I absolutely don't. And it wasn't even as much as that like four hours of my day were wasted. It was that when I wasn't doing it, it was still in my head, you know? So if you can think about things that help you to mentally and physically slow down, those can sometimes help. So maybe that's like a digital detox, you know? Go a, go a weekend without doing anything on your smartphone or take a week off of social media. Those things, whatever it is that can help us mentally slow down, I think can help us get to a quieter place, which helps our prayer life. I think that's very good advice. Can I tell a funny story about mm-hmm. games on your phone? Just real oh, quick. Yeah. This is hilarious. So I, I really don't play games on my phone. I I have Mm -hmm. some on my phone for my kids. And one time we were on a hockey trip a couple of years ago and uh, my in-laws were in town and we had just, I guess we were at a hotel or something. And so Mm -hmm. I had gotten into the habit of during downtime, there was this game called cookie jam Uh on my phone that one of the kids had liked because it was on my mother-in-law's phone. And I was one time in the bathroom and I was like, oh, I'll just (laughs) check this out. 
I got, it was the same as you're talking about with the Tetris game where I, I just loved it. It was mind numbing. It was soothing. So every time I had a little break, I would just kind of play the game. So we got home. And so I like to listen to music using like a Bluetooth speaker. Yeah. So my phone was hooked up to the Bluetooth speaker and I was listening to music. Well, my kids were off doing something. I went in the bathroom and I was like, well, I'll just play cookie jam. And I sat in there and I start playing cookie jam. And I actually went upstairs and they were downstairs, I think. And all of a sudden I hear thumping on the stairs. And one of my kids is like, busted. I said, what are you talking about? And he's like, you're still hooked up to the Bluetooth. <laughs> so oh, they could hear oh, cookie funny. jam, like, and all the little, <laughs> like, beeping and yeah. dinging. So, yeah, anyway, and I just think there's funny for aside. Sure, yeah, there's a place for those kinds of things, for sure. But if it's to the point where, like, you can't quiet your brain down, then it might be time to evaluate, you know? Well, and that goes for social media. I mean, I found yeah. just, ch- you know, setting, uh, setting, um, specific times to do a chunk of, okay, I will check Facebook once a day or check my email a couple of times a day. Cause it it does, it makes your brain buzzing and it it makes it hard to settle down. And one of the things that we had talked about in the smash your prayer blocks was um, just how in this day and age, sometimes we need to train our brain to be still, like you were saying. And mm-hmm. so, you know, maybe just set a, a time of being totally still, totally quiet with no input and yeah. just sit and either read scripture or just be still and quiet and do nothing. Even if it's like 10 seconds, you know, yeah. I'm trying to, I'm trying to be really mindful of when I'm like transitioning from one activity to another, you know, so maybe we've just finished lunch and now it's time for me to do something book related, you know, it's time for me to edit a book instead of like diving right in. Like I'm trying to, and some of it's because I've had eye strain lately. And so like, especially if it's like going from one computer thing to another computer thing, like sometimes even just taking 10 seconds feels hard to me. And so, you know, even if it's just like shut your eyes, three deep breaths, right? How long is that? That's maybe 15 seconds at the most, (laughs) but it can be really helpful. Otherwise I feel like your stress compounds, you know, like the stress you take from one activity gets carried into the next activity. Almost like, I know you've worked in science labs, you know, like a dilution experiment where like you dilute it 10 X here, then you dilute it here. Like, I feel like that happens to our stress and our attention. Mm -hmm. If we're not mindful of what we do in between those times. Um, yeah. So again, that's, that's another just, I guess, facet in this inventory. So we talked about like, is there something spiritual going on in your life? Is there something physical going on in your life? Is there something just mental going on in your life in terms of it's hard for your brain to calm down? Um, you know, and, and maybe let's add the fourth, like maybe there's, I don't want to give too much power to the thing I started out with, you know, like locations and stuff. I don't want to give too much power to that because I feel like some people can really take that overboard and even make it an excuse, right? So like I will freely admit publicly, I had a really, like I was a bad wife (laughs) for the first year and I know a lot of it was hormonal based and I know that that's reason to give myself grace, but I also know that it wouldn't be fair for me to just say, oh yeah, I was a terrible wife because we lived in a depressing location, right? Like it's still on me. And so I don't want to give too much power to that, but it's maybe something to at least consider. And, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. We've used the parallel of prayer and the marriage so many times, but something else got me thinking about it. I'm trying to remember what book I read and it's not coming in, popping into my head right now. But I was reading a book just on kind of like neuroscience and things like this. And it talked about how in a marriage, if you go and experience something new together as a couple, it like, it increases your dopamine and things like this. Mm -hmm. And I could almost see that being a really nice, like if you're just in one of these ruts, like a spiritual rut, just do one thing to try to get yourself out of your routine. So maybe, maybe that means instead of, you know, driving straight home after you drop the kids off at school, maybe you stop at a brand new coffee shop you've never been to. And for 20 minutes, you just sit with your prayer journal or something like, I think sometimes, especially as women and as moms, we can just get in this autopilot mode 
-hmm. And we're, we're super good at that. Like we are amazing at multitasking. We're amazing at managing a whole lot of different things. And sometimes I feel like taking ourselves out of that routine can be enough to just break that rut or Another just option to throw out there. This is kind of our spaghetti on the wall, right? This is like, <laughs> a whole bunch of ideas you can try and see what sticks. But praying with a friend, I think, could also maybe be really, really nice. I haven't done it yet, but I've got a friend that we went to. Um, I'm, I don't want to butcher what it's called, but I had, I knew another woman who was from. I believe a Quaker background. And I don't know too much about it theologically. I'm not advocating that we all like, you know, move to Quaker churches, but I learned about this thing that her community of faith did called, I think it was called holding a silence. And so it would be like, Jamie, do you want to come over and hold a silence with me? And you would oh. come over and we would just like sit for half an hour and not talk to each other and just so it's kind of like, do you want to pray while I pray? But we're not praying out loud or together. We're just you know, physically in the same spot. Kind wow. of like, I have author friends who will do this with writing, right? Like we'll meet on a Google Hangout or on Zoom and I'll be writing. So it's not like we're talking while we're doing it, but there's something about knowing that other people are there. So any of these just kinds of um, new, new things to try, I feel might help get you out of a spiritual rut if you're in one. And we actually, we have a, an episode, it's episode 48 and it's a coffee break. It's called spicing up your prayer life. And it has mm -hmm. like just some suggestions for different things that you can do to kind of get yourself out of a spiritual rut if you feel like you're in it. Yeah. And I think just, um, scripture too, reading the Bible, like sometimes I get to the point where I realize that I am, I don't know how to put it, but sometimes our view of God become small because we're not putting scripture in. We're not reading about him. We're not, um, it, we are kind of like running on previous biblical knowledge. Exactly. To go yeah. forward in our spiritual lives. And I don't think I, there was a time when I thought, well, I know the Bible pretty well. I don't have to read my Bible all the time. I kind of know, but there's something really powerful about reading scripture, like not just thinking about who God is based on what you remember, but reading scripture because it is living and active. And for sure, mm -hmm. I think that can infuse your mind and your spirit with truth and with a perspective that might help unlock that feeling of if it is, because sometimes there might be things hindering your prayers, but other times it could just be that you're just feeling like your prayers aren't going anywhere, even though the reality is that they are. And right. the other thing that came to mind was starting a prayer journal where you can, um, if you haven't already started one or, or writing in it and just, um, choosing one or two things to pray about that are, that, that are on your heart or even asking God, God, what, what should I be praying about and writing those things down and just seeing God work in those areas mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. just focus on a couple of those things. Because I think some of the prayers that we pray, will pray them and then we don't even realize that they're getting answered or we don't acknowledge them because we've forgotten that we prayed them. And so I think yeah. that might be another way to be like, oh, wow, look, there's God at work right now. Like my prayers are going higher than I think. For sure. Yeah. You know, and I think that we can sort of end. So we've given you guys a bunch of questions that you can ask to maybe diagnose why you're feeling this way and some suggestions of what you can do if you are feeling this way. But I think it's important to also add before we close, sometimes we just pray through faith, right? Like yeah. if Jamie, you came to me, how many years have you been married? Are you up to 20? Yeah, we just celebrated 20. Congratulations. Yep. So like if you were to come and say like, I don't know what's going on for the past week, I've just been feeling distant from my husband. Okay, so we can go through some of these things. Well, did you guys get in a fight? Are you, you know, are you disagreeing about things? Are you making time to regularly connect? And sometimes that's gonna give you the answer. And sometimes it's just, yeah, 20 years, you might not get butterflies in your tummy every time you see them. And that doesn't mean that your relationship's suffering. That doesn't mean that something's wrong, right? So I feel like, yes, it's, it's amazing to have a close and intimate and emotional connection with the Lord in prayer, but that's not the goal 
of prayer. Mm -hmm. You know, I see that maybe more as an amazing side effect that keeps us incentivized to pray. Yeah. Oh, that's a good goal. And so sometimes we just keep on praying in faith and, and that can be a reason why maybe God's apparently stepping back, right? Like I think most of us, if we've been walking with the Lord for a long time, can look back at periods where God, like on a daily basis has seemed so close. And Mm -hmm. it's like, you pray one thing and immediately there's the answer. And then you pray something else, immediately there's the answer, right? And then other times it just, it's, it's not like that. And I don't, like I said, it's not always because of us. It's not always even because of circumstances. I think sometimes God chooses to like he's he's not distant from us, but I think he chooses to reveal himself less to mm-hmm. train us to walk in faith more. You know, kind of like for a child, a toddler to learn how to walk, they can't always be carried by the mom or dad, mm-hmm. right? And sometimes I remember once I felt so far from God and I was, I was still very connected to just kind of the emotional experience. So I thought if I wasn't emotionally connecting with God, then he was either mad at me or I had done something terrible. Mm. Right. And I remember just a, a picture or a word. And it was that like, you know, God's, God's always close to us, but sometimes, so I'm watching this, but you know how, um, like Moses, he couldn't see God's glory, right? A mortal Mm -hmm. cannot see God's glory. So I feel like sometimes God's so close at work that he has to maybe reveal less of himself. Hmm. Say what I'm trying to say, because I'm I'm watching it, but I think you get what I'm, <laughs> what no, I'm saying. No, I definitely get what you're saying. That yeah, that he's he's very close at work behind the scenes or doing things mm-hmm. that that we don't have to see, or that mm-hmm. he, like you said, couldn't make known to us, or mm-hmm. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Well, what it reminds me of is my driver's ed instructor, who. Mm-hmm. Like, you know how they have the controls? I'm assuming that they would override the controls. Yes. It was a teaching vehicle. Right. right. But it was the day that I was supposed to get onto the highway and actually do highway driving, which uh-huh. was terrifying. Yeah. And I got onto the highway and he gave me some instructions, you know, go, you know, fast enough to stay with the speed of traffic. Don't worry about the speed limit. Just get in there and get in with the traffic. And then, you know, he gave me some preliminary instructions. Is this well, a big city? Where were you? near DC. So Southern Maryland. So there, it was the beltway. It was the DC beltway. That's, that is scary. Yeah. So we got on and, um, so I, I did it. I was merging and I'm thinking, Oh, I'm doing great. He opened a newspaper and I am not, I, you can't make this up, but he opened a newspaper very like theatrically. I think, I think he did it on purpose, but he opened a newspaper and he had it like up over his face. Like he wasn't even watching. And I mean, I'm guessing this was a tactic that he used. I don't know, but I was like, That's oh, terrifying. what are you doing? Yeah. But I just have this feeling that he knew what was going on and that at any moment, I hope, mm-hmm. please God, let it have been so. Yeah, right. But, <laughs> but I, I have this feeling that he always kind of knew what was going on, mm-hmm. that at any moment he could have put on the brakes, he could have turned the steering wheel mm-hmm. if something bad were about to happen. That's but a neat analogy. He, he kind of wanted me to feel alone. So that yes. I could got used to exercise it. Exercise my whatever. Your independent driving. <laughs> my independent driving. So maybe that's a little bit of what God does. No, I I times. love that. Now speaking of, as a total aside, both of us are about to have fourteen year olds, which in Alaska is when you can get a driver's permit. I know, right? Are you signing up for that soon, or are you going to wait? I don't know. Um, we we hadn't like talked about it in real terms. We've talked uh-huh. theoretically about it. My husband mentioned the other day, yeah, no, he's not going to drive right at 14. But I mean, I don't have a problem. Like I know my dad used to take me when I was 14 or 15 before I could get my learner's permit mm-hmm. in dry, in like parking lots. Parking and stuff. lots and stuff. Yeah. So I don't know. We might get it. I don't picture him behind the wheel in a Isn't month. Isn't it crazy? Uh, yeah. So in Alaska, but what I do like is that they have two full years because in Alaska, they don't get their driver's license till 16 still. Yeah. So, you know, I think that extra time of practice is good. Well, but- and you need a full winter season. I mean, driving Absolutely. in winter Alaska is so different than driving in summer Alaska. 
It is. And I was not ready at 16. My brain, I look back, I, w- I did not understand the gravity of what I was doing. And I was mm-hmm. reckless. I, I was not aware. I, and I've acknowledged I'm not the greatest driver. I just don't have a lot of I, I'm easily distracted. Mm-hmm. I get, you know, if there are people in you're the reading the newspaper me, behind the wheel. Hey, yeah. my my driver's ed instructor taught me that that's how you drive. That's right. <laughs> so I don't know, but I I just he's thankfully way more on top of things than me. But I still I I don't know. What about you guys? Are you thinking? Do it well, well, please do the permit and yeah. like my husband's the one. Like I he's he's going to handle it, which I'm very thankful for. I don't think that I'm I'm a good person to do that. I think, think, yeah, if I were a single mom, I think I would probably just sign him up for driver's ed. I don't think that I would uh, be a good driving teacher. Yeah. I think the extra time to drive is good though. The extra practice time. Absolutely. Yeah. But it's just so scary. It's like they're they're little kids. You know what I realized? Like we, we did the math. We're way, assuming all the kids move out at 18 ish, we're like way over the halfway mark of being parents. No, it's weird. Yeah, that is very weird. I saw something funny that my my cousin posted this thing, and it was like, uh, my forty five or my at forty five, I am like laughing at my friends who waited a long time oh, to yeah. have kids mm-hmm. because my kids are grown and like almost yeah. out of the house, and I'm not that person though. I'm forty three and I still have a six year old. So I've got right. a ways to go. But a anyway, little bit, yeah. But my cousin, yeah, had her kids most of had two of her kids early and then had a couple of them still kind of early. And so Yeah, she's, yeah. All our kids are in my twenties. So I'll be yeah, I'll be a young you'll um, be a empty young nester. empty nester. Yeah. And I'm I'm looking forward to it to be honest. <laughs> yeah. But I'm enjoying the stage that we're in as well. It is. It's really every stage has got its benefits. I am finding myself getting a little melancholy as I think of the, you know, almost 14 mm-hmm. year old and just where yeah, he is. And sending kids off to high school. Right? And, uh, crazy. That's All crazy. right. Well, somehow we veered off topic. How did me. that happen? Well, <laughs> I just wanted to say, okay, so Sally. No, you are not alone. You are not the only one that feels like God isn't hearing you sometimes. I really hope, this is one of our older questions, I think. So I really hope that Sally, you are in a place now where you're past that rut. But if you're not, just know that we are praying for you. And Julie, we definitely, we wonder also how effective our prayers are. And I just, I hope that both of you have been able to see God just amazingly at work in your lives since this question was posed, but we would love to hear from both of you to let us know how you're doing. So email us at connect at prayingchristianwomen.com and let us know that you heard this episode and how you're doing and how we can be praying for you. Um, So we have our prayers for the unsaved. Before we close in prayer, we're going to do, this is the time in our podcast where we um, just pray for the two to four, I don't know what our number is, one to three (laughs) people that God has placed on our hearts to pray for, for the long haul. And I have to confess, this show is often, our recording times are often my prompting to pray for the unsaved people in my life. There are times when I don't do it on my own until I get prompted by the show recording. And since Alana and I do our show recordings in batches, I'll have these, you know, okay, yeah, now I need to pray. And so I'll be praying pretty regularly and then we'll stop recording for a while and then I'll sort of taper off. So it's been a while since I have prayed for those people on my list. But I will say that one of the people on my list um, came back to the Lord since I began praying. I, I got to be in touch with the person and it was really exciting for me to see that these prayers, you know, which have been going on for a long time, many, many years for this person had been answered and she had come back to the Lord. So, um, keep praying, don't give up. So, um, so yeah, let's, let's pray. And if you enjoy these prayers for the unsaved, you can go to prayingchristianwomen.com slash unsaved, and you can get them delivered to your inbox. Um, or the most exciting thing is that you can actually go to Amazon and get prayers for the unsaved. Oh, I wish I had brought it up here. That so I could been sh- fun, yeah. Yeah, so I could show people maybe in, in one of our other recordings, but you can get it in paperback and it's in large print, which I love. And it's beautiful. It just turned out so nice. I was so excited when I got them in the mail. So I'm going to give some as gifts. And um, if you like to have 
prayers, you know, if you like to have a book in your hand, like I do, definitely go to Amazon and look for 30 days of prayer for the unsaved. And yeah, that'd be great. So let's pray. Dear God, today I pray for spiritual breakthrough. I pray that the eyes of my friend's heart would be open so they can know the hope you've called them to. I pray that you would show them the riches of your glorious inheritance. I pray that you would tear down every stronghold that has set their mind against you. Free them from these chains, dear Lord. I pray that my friend would become a Christian who not only confesses your name, but boldly proclaims it to others, leading others to victory in Christ. I pray that you would pour out so much mercy and grace on my friend's life that they would come running to you with a heart of gratitude and love a heart that will never want to return to the life they've known before. Only you can do this, Lord. You're my friend's only chance for salvation. Please don't let them down, but come quickly to save them, deliver them, and grant them all spiritual victory by the powerful name of Jesus, the Savior of the world. Amen. Amen. And again, you can send us your questions. We really enjoy hearing from you and hearing what's on your heart at prayingchristianwomen.com slash questions. And thanks, guys, for listening, and we'll talk to you soon.